My name is Kate. I am a PMI WDC uh, symposium volunteer with us today. Um, we are in the strategic and business management track. Today, this morning's session is seven ways your business can thrive in a down economy. Uh, so this morning, we are fortunate to have Hector de Castillo uh, with us today. And uh, Hector is a product executive with over 20 years of experience helping client companies offerings to grow faster than their competition. He has worked with a variety of technology and software companies ranging in sizes and revenues from large to small. He loves his work because he connects with trains and coaches and inspires high performing leaders and teams to, uh, grow, uh, excuse me, to build a growth engine within their organizations. Hector is an internationally recognized speaker who sparks team creativity and innovation to substantially transform and grow their companies, which has resulted in a profitability growth of over 26%. He enjoys working with companies that want to make a massive positive impact in their community and in the world. Help me introducing and welcoming Hector to the stage. Thank you, thank you so much. Let me know if I'm too loud because sometimes I tend to project, even I'm, as I'm wearing a wireless microphone. And today's discussion is gonna be about ways that you can actually, as a business owner or as an executive, figure out what you need to do to reallocate the right resources, the right funding for the right customers before things get worse in the, in, in the economy. And we're gonna go through a lot of information, so first thing I wanna, give a special thanks to everyone at the PMI Washington DC chapter for putting together this educational event. And it's a great honor and pleasure to be, for me to be here. I actually have been, spoken at previous symposia and this is actually my first, uh, my first time in three years because I have not been able to, because of uh, commitments uh, with clients, not been able to be here. I, I am gonna be recording this entire discussion and what I do at Beyond, what we do is we work with technology and software owners, companies, mid-market companies that need help because they're struggling in the marketplace and they need to figure out how to get quick growth. And we work with them even as they are already uh, mid-market companies may have actually international offerings, meaning their customers are not just the US, they're actually also in, in, in other parts of the world. If you're on Twitter, use this particular handles and hashtag, use the uh, PM Symposium uh, hashtag, also business growth hashtag, and then you can use my company's Beyond MA handle or my own HM Del Castillo. And you can also follow us on a company page on LinkedIn, bit.ly beyond 19 is a short URL that goes directly to our company page. You can follow us because we send out a lot of information about things that we hear about from economists and experts who are tracking uh, multiple industries and markets that impact mid-market companies. If you are here, I wanna thank you and you can actually use this short URL to check in. It's a web form that you submit what you will get immediately after this is a link to a page that has my entire slides, everything that I'm showing here, already posted so you can follow along. Also, there's an ebook that you can access from there as well. You're gonna get an email where you can download the ebook, same uh, very related topic, which is nine surefire ways to grow your company fast. And that is our specialty. So if you can go to that link, um, that, that will be the one that you can actually start getting this information and uh, get also access to the ebook as well. And just warning, there's a lot of information that I'm gonna be discussing. So first off, as we get started, let me, let me ask, how many of you are business owners? You have your own business and you have employees. Raise your hands. A few of you, okay. How many of you are right now maybe thinking about launching a new company because you're not really happy right now where you're employed. You're unhappily em employed. Raise your hands. All of these are the, the, the main discussion. It would be about this, uh, understanding the economy and things, you know, what are the right conditions and the wrong conditions in trying to launch a company. And really, the discussion will focus specifically on understanding that first so that you can uh, then plan accordingly. 
So a recent global survey that Ant Strategy did, there's actually a company that was uh, a, a subsidiary of PwC, published this information earlier this year. As they actually surveyed executives across industries, global survey, this is what came out. Only 8% of company leaders, these are the company executives of companies, believe that they have what it takes within the company to both excel at strategy and its execution. So where is the rest of the 92% and which companies are those? Because that's the majority of everybody else has strategy to execution gaps, which from a business point of view are growth killers. And you want to make sure that you don't have any growth killers in your organization because whenever there's disruption, whenever there's a change, significant change in the economy in the wrong direction, those companies are going to be here today and before the recovery occurs, guess what happens to those companies? They're going to be gone, right? And I can name you examples of multiple companies that at one point were billion dollar companies or more that are no longer here. And if they're around, they've actually have imploded and not even close to where they're at. You guys are familiar with Kodak, Blockbuster, Toys R Us. These companies were been around for a long time and because they never really closed their strategy to execution gaps, look at what happened. And the economy hasn't even gotten that bad, right? It's been a very slow growth mode for the last 10 years and, and nothing more than that. So it's important to understand how can your company thrive, not just in good times, but also thrive in tough economic times. Because it is possible. The main difference is that you really need to focus on have a strategy that is so brilliant that you're basically are communicating to everyone, not just your own people in your building, but also to the world, why you exist as a company and your unique value proposition and make sure that's relevant in the market. And that tends to change because buyer behavior changes outside of your control. And also what happens in the industry and in the markets is also outside of your control. So the best thing you can do is anticipate, anticipate, anticipate in order for you to be prepared and have that emergency business plan that you can launch when economic conditions are harsh. And that it takes a lot of work to be prepared and continue to practice, practice, practice all these things because when good times, when there's good times, everybody's happy and nobody wants to work any harder than what you're already doing and nobody's thinking about what's next for the company. So let's, we're, we're going to be covering this current situation. We're going to be discussing also seven different ways that your company can thrive, pitfalls that you can avoid, and we're going to have Q&A. Uh, so let's get ready to, to begin the current situation. Current situation, what are economies saying? Well, everybody's saying today, and uh, the majority of economists that have been polled, and actually for the last first few months of this year, lots of articles everywhere about different economists saying this bubble is about to pop. It's a 10-year bubble, and we've been artificially maintaining it along, and something is about to happen. And trying to predict when this is going to happen is trying to predict when the next earthquake is going to hit in California, right? Everybody knows that it's coming. Nobody's really doing anything about it. They just continue doing their, 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 uh, along their way. And that is human nature, right? We are just bad at really assessing or understanding bad risk from good risk. And when there's good risk, we take advantage of that, but we never really think about the bad situations that do occur outside of our control, and that's when we need to be more than prepared. We need to anticipate so that we can actually ensure that we have what it takes to not only survive, but actually thrive when other people have, for the most part, not been preparing um, as well. So U.S. economy is uh, on a recession watch. Uh, so you're looking at every single channel or viewing different websites. They're all saying the same thing. They're seeing the early warning detection systems that something is about to happen, that nobody knows why or when, because everybody's saying somewhere between now and the next 24 months. 
even the people that claim that they know, actually know, you know, they're, they're really not, not really, uh, really saying much exact, exactly as to what's going to be uh, happening. I want to ask a question. Within your company, those of you who have your own company or are uh, leaders, executives, managers of your own companies, what do you believe is the biggest barrier to actually getting positive growth and just massive growth of your company? Which one of these would you say is the most important thing that you need to focus on? You guys can, can you raise your hand, let me know what you believe. Yes? I believe planning is everything. Planning? Okay. Anybody else? Yes. Funding. 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 Okay. Because without funding, nothing happens. Funding. Also. Okay. Anybody else? A sales strategy. Okay. Well, if you ask the experts, these are the top five reasons why any company implodes. Not one, but often more than one of these things can actually cause a company to implode. And what you want to do is you want to start looking at, you know, what is, what is it that we're doing as far as our resources, the processes, our systems, and our tools, and how are we managing suppliers and partners, and then also channels, delivery and distribution channels, in order to ensure that we have a healthy value chain in our business. And it's the same reasons why, though all five of these are reasons why companies fail in the market. Here's another TED talk that I would refer you to. We don't have time to actually view it because it's actually uh, about 10 minutes long. It's a great watch. BCG partner saying two reasons why companies fail. They either only optimize and uh, just focus on performance, 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 zero exploration, or they only explore and diversify without optimization. And what he's really saying is that there's, you can't be at the extremes. You have to have that balance between both optimizing the right things as well as exploring new things that you should, be, uh, that you should actually learn now so that by the time you need them, they can actually be part of your survival plan or your, or your growth plan when things go south in the economy. And that's, that's what a BCG partner is saying about today's environment. Current situation is that downturns actually affect smaller and mid-market companies a lot more than large companies. If you're looking at right now, how many of you are actually looking for, let's say, a senior management, executive management positions, even with, with a small mid-market company? How many of you are actually looking right now for the you know, senior management positions? What are you seeing right now is the number of job openings that are now being posted compared to the way it was at the beginning of, 20, of, of 2019. It's slowing down. It's an early indicator because most companies at the very beginning, especially the mid-market companies, they will stop hiring before because they're already afraid of that R word that they're seeing all over the news, right? And their immediate behavior is, we just won't hire anymore. We'll only be hiring if we really need, if we have attrition, significant attrition that we need to fill in and backfill. Other than that, there's no new hiring right now. And it's already seeing, if you're seeing the numbers right now, whether you're using Monster or LinkedIn or whatever, you're seeing specific senior and executive positions, less of those, unless you're a brand new company that is trying to get established. The cost of capital usually rises immediately. So the best thing to do is if you know that you might need some cash for surviving for the next three years, make sure you are you asking for it now, not when it happens. Better be prepared and have a line of credit that is much higher than what you usually need because you know that you might need it. And you need to start establishing those relationships and that means that not only one bank, you might need to maybe have a relationship with maybe three to four banks, not just one. These are all things that you want to do ahead of time. What do these companies share in common? From HP to FedEx to CNN, IBM, Disney, Burger King, GM, Microsoft, and Apple. What do you think they have in common? They're huge. They're, they're large, yes. And the, many of them are market leaders, yes. 
A lot of innovation going on, yes. Did they all start in a garage? The majority of them did start in a garage, and here's the reasons why. They all started during a recession. All of these companies, when they got started, they got started during a recession. And it's documented because analysts actually have published information that all of these companies, when they started, when they first started, started during a recession. So if these companies got started and now became market leaders, global leaders, market companies in a recession, could you not only start a business, but also prosper your own business in a down economy? The answer is yes, yes, and yes. You just have to be prepared because it takes a lot of preparation and it's a lot of work ahead of time in order to make sure that you know exactly what to do and what not to do. Because it comes to the assignment of people, processes, customers, and the products that you're gonna be selling to monetize the company. And that will lead to profitable offerings. And you need to make sure that you're very clear as to which things you need to prioritize more and defend in the marketplace, and which things you just wanna maybe put on hold for some time or just kill so that you can then allocate your resources on the things that you need to defend because that is your core business. And you need to do this ahead of time, not after the economy tanks. So we're gonna talk about seven ways to thrive in a down economy. And very quickly, the very first thing starts with understanding your strategy and make sure that it's about growing, not just keeping the company steady, because steady mode is only gonna keep you alive in good times, not necessarily in bad times. You wanna be able to ensure that you have the mechanisms to keep the right people in your company, inspire the leaders and the teams to become high-performing teams. Because running a business is not a one-person job. It never is. You've got to be a leader and enable other leaders within your company, and then everybody is running high-performing teams and know what that means. You want to be able to boost the customer value. You want to be able to improve your cash flow management today before things happen, increase operational efficiency within your organization, and then ex look for opportunities to expand your offering in addition to move quickly on any mergers or acquisitions because you already would know that some of these opportunities are very short, have narrow windows, and if you miss them, they won't come again, and sometimes it only occurs once or maybe twice in a lifetime. If you miss them, you will never see them again until maybe a few decades later. So you've gotta be prepared, and you gotta have the right position in order to do number seven right, because the people that don't prepare, they are the ones that are gonna be on fire sale at the time, and if you don't have the cash in hand, or the ability, those companies are gonna be most, most likely acquired for pennies on the dollar by not you, most likely your competition. And now your competition is gonna be a, complete, a completely different level than you, that you had traditionally had before. So you wanna do all of these seven at the right, uh, and have a portfolio across all seven, not just one, all seven as you're allocating resources. Strategy is about really making sure that at least you have the discipline as, an, as a company to get together and say, how are we doing and why are we here? And are we really keeping our promises in the marketplace? Are we really looking at the right things to actually understand value that we're delivering from the customer's point of view and making sure that we know exactly how to maximize that perceived value and still be competitive in the marketplace? Strategy is about simply understanding what are the right things to do for the business versus the things that you just should not even consider. And make sure that all of, everybody in the room is clear. And your strategy should be about really figuring out how is it that you're going to design and maintain and support a growth engine within your organization. To assess, analyze, and understand where you're at so you can then plan accordingly and make sure your plan doesn't have any errors or omissions because you forgot to consider something that you should have done because it's bad risk, high impact, and, uh, and it impacts your value proposition in the market if it does occur. 
And these are the things that you want to be able to eliminate. Any bad risk that it is and identify it starts with identification at the very beginning so that you know exactly when you need to uh, e escalate to go into a different mode when things do happen. And be able to not only have the strategy, but then translate that strategy into action. And usually there's four components to any strategic, to any uh, strategy that is actionable that has to do with what do you do with your people? How do you enable your teams? What is it that you're doing to processes, systems, and, and tools that you're using to make, improve your operational efficiency? What are the financial metrics that you're going to gauge success in addition to what customers do you need to retain, retain, retain versus acquire? Because often growth means you need to do not just retention, you need to do acquisition of new customers as well. You need to do both. And that's what you need to have clarity. What are the things that you can do to, number one, retain the right customers at all costs. Number two, acquire the right type of customers. Who are they, what do they do, and what do they consider value? Walmart, a few years ago, five years ago, you know, Walmart, largest retailer in US today, even today, biggest retailer, but they were seeing Amazon come up. And Amazon was already number one, already selling at a billion dollars five years ago, uh, a year in, in across markets. So Walmart actually started thinking, we need to do something. And they actually founded Walmart.com as a separate subsidiary that is actually located in Silicon Valley, right next door to Yahoo, right next door to eBay, and all those players that are part of Silicon Valley, that's where Walmart is located. When the company is actually the headquarters, the world headquarters are in Arkansas, Walmart.com is actually headquartered in Silicon Valley. Guess where they were at at the beginning of this year in, in online sales? Walmart.com, just online sales. They were number two in US, second only to Amazon.com. And yes, Amazon.com has been growing, but now when there's other wannabes like Amazon.com, Walmart.com is number two right now in the world. And it's because five years ago, they got started on their emergency plan. Their, their retail business is still rising, but their online sales are rising even faster today than retail. And that was because five years ago, they started a brand new line of business that focuses on just online sales of whatever items, same items that you, we're all buying when we go to Walmart retail stores, you can actually now buy on walmart.com. And they're fully utilizing their stores as actual distribution channels, just like Amazon is trying to establish across markets today. How many econ economic recessions have there been in the US? Kind of a trivia. We're going to have some questions that are kind of trivia. Can anybody guess how many recessions since the country was started? 20. 20. Anybody else? 7. 30. Here's the number, 47. 47 recessions since the country was in inception. And if you don't believe that, there's actually, this information is on Wikipedia, actually. There's, there's an, um, information that, that I found there, and it has chronological order of the recessions in US. These are US recessions. And number two, inspire great leaders and teams. Well, inspiring great leaders and teams requires that you actually, number one, are, are encouraging and actually enabling people to take lead when they're, when they're willing to do so. And not only lead them and, and lead them in different ways, because you can delegate to people who are saying, hey, I'm ready, but if you don't know, if you don't know that they are missing knowledge, delegating uh, you know, through just training alone, sometimes it's, it's like the equivalent of setting them up for failure. Because there's more to, uh, that, you can, that you need to know when you need to, uh, uh, somebody to actually start doing, you need to actually make sure that they're fully enabled before they can actually be productive and something new when, it's, when there's very little expertise within the organization. So usually you need to have the right culture and maybe make sure that you're cultivating and nurturing the right people within your company and that you eliminate anyone that is a toxic person that may be a great performer, 
but they're just, nobody wants to work with those people. And I don't know if you've been in those environments, I have, and I know how that movie ends for, for those companies that actually keep those people who are high performers but toxic, what happens to those companies over time when, they, when, when people are saying that you know, no matter how good they, they try, you know, somebody is putting them down, not really encouraging them or not really enable them to do the right things. You do want to eliminate any toxic people and workers within your company and encourage and reward productive people. And make sure you train them. They're not going to know what they don't know by, on their own. Not everybody, all of us are self-learners, right? Sometimes we, we have to have that expertise and ex experience. It's only acquired by doing. And expect that if you, the first few t times, yeah, we're going to fail, but just keep on encouraging to, to, to continue on. And a, a different study, Bain actually published a recent study saying when we looked at these companies, the companies that actually inspire employees are actually great at not just retaining customers when they, are, you know, they need to have repeat customers coming all the time because over time those people will it's almost like infectiously invite customers and those customers that are keeping them, that are, are satisfied and happy because those people are delivering a great customer experience keep coming back and back and back across locations. So inspiring people, especially with our customer facing workers in your company actually helps you in retain and also acquire new customers. If you do that alone, if you have a, ret if you have a retail or even if you do that alone and you have it, you're on online retail and you have the right support people dealing with inquiries from customers, whether they're chats or answering your call center or answering emails when you're an online retailer, that's all the things that you need to do as part of your support. Focusing on that alone will actually drive more customers and retention. And that leads to more sales, which leads to profitability. Southwest is a perfect example. Since 9-11, the only airline in the US that has been profitable. And today, they're now an international airline because they actually acquire AirTran, and AirTran was already an international airline in that acquisition, and they now have integrated successfully all of AirTran operations. And today, they continue to set the mark because no one, no other airline delivers the right experience. How many of you have flown Southwest? Look around, it's the majority of the room. And you know, if, we, if you ever have a bad experience with Southwest, they'll take care of you. They won't behave like other airlines. And that's all because they focus on the, this same principle. You inspire your people, the people will inspire, and actually retain customers and, and help you acquire customers to keep you buying from you as a vendor. That is the principle that Southwest was founded on and they still are doing it today, even as they're already almost, what, 50 years old. Focus on understanding customers' perception of value of whatever you're delivering and maximize whatever you do, you're delivering at a competitive price and that focuses on retention. More value, same price as everybody else, even if you have a Me Too offering, but you focus on controlling and managing the customer experience and being much better than everybody else, this will help you retain. Offering more for the competitor price, promote, promote, promote to ensure that you have a room full, uh, if, you're, if you have a restaurant, that your restaurant is filled, all the tables are filled during your peak times throughout the week. That's what this is all about. And it's not just because they are, many of those people are just looking to get, you know, whatever they're going to be serving uh, or whatever they're going to be ordering from the menu. They want other things and you need to understand what those are because even though you think you might have a product which is your menu and that's what you're, how you're monetizing, you're, the way that you're serving the food, the way that you're greeting the people as they're walking in, all those things matter when this is your, your business and you need to understand that up front in order to boost that value without necessarily driving a lot more sales. Most companies, when you're looking at why they struggle, is because if you look at their cost of acquiring customers versus the total lifetime value of acquiring one customer, they're upside down. And what that means is that 
yeah, what the easy thing for them to do is to just retain customers. And retention alone is never enough to help you grow the business. It just maintains your current position. It doesn't help you raise your business position. So if you have a model that's upside down, the majority of your marketing activities and your sales is just selling to the same key accounts or the same customers, no more, because it's costly for you. What you need to start doing is figuring out how to have the right processes in place to promote and, have the, and continues to promote in different ways, different channels to actually get your model to become like this. But having said that, the only way that you can turn around an upside down business model to one that is better balanced in this case is through marketing activities. Not sales, marketing activities. Your people, your processes, and your promotional activities, and make sure you know exactly what goes on. Seasonality, whenever there's seasonality and there's the right time for you to be offering some, some things, you make sure that you have those throughout the entire year. A hotel like this, I can guarantee you, the manager of a hotel like this, they know week by week how many rooms they have and what is their average fill factor for that night to be profitable for them for that week. Anything below, you've got staff, you've got utilities to pay for, and it's mostly going to be losses if you don't have a certain amount of rooms filled each and every night of that week. And so what happens when they're, when they're, when they're below the fill factor? If they know ahead of time, they will promote, promote, promote. And this is where all of us that have uh, are on their uh, rewards, we get like, oh, you get three nights, you know, you get the fourth night free when you're stay three. These are all the ways that they're offering and then promote in different ways when to actually start creating a more, a, a more balanced business model, especially those of you that work in service provider industries. Promotion has to go along with what you do because this is not sales. This is just offering the product, whatever you're offering, at the right time to, when, you, when you know that, that uh, you need to make sure that you have that you, that you have revenue, and not just revenue, but actually profitability as well. Chick-fil-A and McDonald's, great, great, both are, are great, quick convenience. Which one, is, which one has more revenue today? Because they've been around for some time. McDonald's has much higher revenue, it's a global company. Chick-fil-A is mostly regional, they, they start, they're starting, they're a younger company. They're already not just in the US, but also North America but not the number of retail McDonald's locations around the world. Which company is more profitable by location? Chick-fil-A Chick is. Even though in their business model, by design from the very beginning, they're only open six days out of the week, when some of the McDonald's locations are open 24-7. What do you think that is? What do you think that Chick-fil-A restaurants are more profitable even as McDonald's is here, and lots of us are going to McDonald's. It's a service. It's a, it's a management of the experience, and for them, it's very simple. When you walk in, somebody's welcoming you. you you've, they're fumbling around looking for the app to say what you want to order, and they say, just give me your phone number, and we can make whatever being on promotion, it's already in our point of sales. You don't have to show a code if you don't have it available on your mobile app. That is accommodation. So all of these things do matter because it goes back to that point number that I made earlier. You inspire your people, and they will inspire more customers to be coming in. And the result is that Chick-fil-A, it's a it's a less cost structures because they don't they don't have to be open seven days a week or 24/7. They're only open six days a week, and location by location. Chick-fil-A is more profitable than any McDonald's location today. So many of these principles do work even when you have much bigger co competition because when nobody's looking at the things that matter, this is your secret sauce to actually win in the marketplace. Another trivia, when was the Great Depression? What year? Anybody know? I'm hearing like 30s, 20s. Here's the answer, 29 to 33. That was the, it started in August of 29, it ended in March of 1933. And that is really the main difference between a recession and a depression. 
Recessions don't last that long. Depressions last a long time. This was almost four years of, 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 uh, that we were in this great depression. So recovery took longer as well, right? The longer it takes for you to get out, the longer the recovery takes as well. Number four, improve your cash flow management. Especially if you're a small business, if you're even a mid-market company, cash flow is the lifeblood of your company. So make sure you know what are the right people that you should be investing your money on, even if you're paying them wages. What are the right processes to be improving and investing in for the future of your company? And what are the right products that you should be maintaining in your portfolio and even preparing to introduce into your portfolio when the time is right in the market. These are all things that require funding. And if you don't have enough funding and you're mostly gonna be operating in losses, it's gonna be impossible for you to deploy any of the, of the things. So number one is you wanna make sure that you want to improve your cash flow management based on what you have, your cost structures and your revenue streams. Here's an example. Get better at forecasting your sales. I've been in, in companies where the teams have been around just looking around at each other and they're telling me, you know, oh yeah, we have this much in the pipeline for next quarter. And I can tell the people that just have no, nothing. They're just, you know, because they want to have something to say, they say it, but just nothing because there's really not enough retention or acquisition of new customers. And that's the company's problem. Marketing, focus, you know, helps the sales and you can't expect sales to perform if you're underinvesting in your marketing activities and vice versa. You can't have the right customers or understand who, who are the right customers that are in the queue for acquisition without enough, enough marketing activities. These are all things you want to be able to, to understand. If you have receivables, make sure that you don't have any bad debt. Any customers that are not paying, you want to be able to just churn them and say, you know, maybe even introduce them to your competitors instead. You keep the ones that are paying you. Payables, these are your suppliers. Maybe you need to encourage your suppliers or compete your suppliers to actually give you more favorable payment terms so that you can then pay uh, uh, over time and then take in and then delay payment because that helps your company's cash flow situation. And this is, you need to have positive cash flow for any of these growth opportunities that you have. And you can also start looking that if you do have a lot of excess capacity that is needed because you need to have a business, maybe you should outsource some of these things. And sometimes what I see the struggle is most companies think that, you know, there are some things that they should be outsourcing that they don't because they think that's their secret sauce. And all I see is some cost on excess capacity that they're not monetizing on. And there's nothing in their roadmap to monetize in the next year. So why are they spending all this money for? It's just wasted capital. If you, so you need to start looking across any of these opportunities to improve your company's cash flow position. And the other thing you want to do is you want to be able to in, in, increase the number of or recurring revenue streams. This is what everybody has been doing right now because these are examples of companies that whether you have contracts or you have an automatic payment or sequential payments or repeat revenue, the ones that work harder every time to just retain customers are the ones below. When you are basically looking for a lot of repeat customers, that's going to be a, a lot of work just on, on retention. The other ones to help you say, I want to keep the right customers for a long time because they pay on time and they are not as price sensitive. So these are examples of companies that do that. Apple, the number one thing, and one of the companies that got started in 75, along with Microsoft, in 2001, they were at the inflection point of the company, because the company was already tanking because they were only a laptop and computer company. What enabled Apple to come in is one thing alone, that was recurring revenue. From what? Does anybody know? How many of you are Apple users? iPhone, but it wasn't just the iPhone, it was actually iTunes the service. Because iTunes, believe it or not, whatever content you have paid for, whether it's a dollar or less or more on any content that now you're deploying across all your devices, that is recurring, not only recurring revenue, it's recurring profitability for all of Apple. Whatever you guys have loaded content across your devices paid uh, Apple via iTunes, 
25% this margin to Apple. From 2001, when they launched iPod with iTunes, and then they extended iTunes across all Apple devices, this is why the company today is the number one global brand. Recurring revenue is powerful. It gives you multipliers in value for your business if all you do is focus on figuring out how to implement recurring residual revenue streams from whatever you're offering in the marketplace today. Just put everybody on recurring revenue and figure out how to make that profitable. It will take work. It won't happen by itself. Increase operational efficiency. And what that means, you want to be able to bridge any strategy to execution gaps that you know you're, you have through your operational model. Operational a model may include your company structure, your resources, the tools, the systems, the technologies that you're using to ensure that you are automating without losing the quality or the value proposition that you're delivering in the marketplace. And these things take a lot of alignment and a lot of management in place to do these things right, especially as your company gets bigger. There are five ways you can improve your, your operating model, and these are the different things that you can refer to if you're looking for opportunities to improve and increase your company's operational efficiency. Caterpillar is an example. Today, they want to say, we want to avoid somebody doing an Uber to us in our industry. And there are a lot of companies that have jumped in around markets in different parts. When this is a, it's a global company, they have a lot of new competitors in different markets, and they're already looking at disrupting themselves. Already doing, not, where you don't have to buy their equipment, you're leasing, and leasing includes maintenance and support of any industrial equipment that they actually offer in any market. So they're actually working on the people that can not just install, deliver, help operate when you have people that need a fleet and they need help in operating that fleet at the right time to make sure that they can fully utilize the, the, the things that they're buying from or leasing from Caterpillar. Here's another trivia. How many CEOs have led a US company through a US depression or recession? Very simple. How, how long was the depression, the Great Depression? Yeah, there's no living CEO today, right? There's zero CEOs, and this is important because most people today, even if they think, oh yeah, we, you know, we're, we're gonna be better than, you know, I'm better than Steve Jobs, or I'm the next Elon Musk, or whatever, they haven't gone through a significant recession, which is what's coming, according to the economists. Number six, expand your portfolio. Not only do you work on maintaining your current best sellers in market, you're now looking at what's next in your roadmap and make sure that it's the right thing and you know what is the right time in the market and the industry for you to bring that product or that offering into, into the market. Not always is the market going to be in your favor. You need to understand in order to ensure that there can be a high product to market fit, when is it the right time for you to actually be able to, to do this? Different ways of expanding your portfolio. I'm not necessarily gonna get into details because I do wanna wrap up and actually get, it, uh, actually get into Q&A before the end. Amazon Web Services is a perfect example of, of what, what I'm talking about. They're number one global today. And even today, why do you think HQ2 actually is in Arlington? Who else is located in, in headquarters in Arlington? Pentagon, and they just won a big, big multi-billion dollar 10-year contract that is, and that's the reason why most everybody at HQ2 is not gonna be commercial. Everybody commercial will be somewhere else. Here, they're gonna be servicing the Pentagon and Department of Defense. That, that is the reason why HQ2 is here. No, nothing else, because these guys are number one today and a very more prof, most profitable cloud service provider in the world. Move quickly on M&A opportunities. The window of opportunity are extremely short, and they don't happen very often. Maybe once, twice in a lifetime. So when they do happen, you need to, number one, know that they're the right opportunities. You need to be prepared with that information. Number two, you need to be in the right financial situation to be able to offer something. And acquiring is some, something you can do to actually scale your business very quickly, and you can do it for different reasons. If you're prepared, if you've done one through six, as I mentioned earlier, 
The next thing will be to actually look for suitable targets that you know are in trouble today and it's good times and when they're in trouble today and it's good times, what do you think is happening to those companies when the economy goes down? They're going to be bankrupt or going out of business and this is your opportunity to acquire them. That's what you need to understand. There's a lot of assessment uh, about this beyond just competitive analysis. Stanley and Black & Decker, two different companies and now they are merged. And it's because Stanley has been trying to acquire Black & Decker for some time. And Black & Decker said, no, we're, it doesn't make sense for us, we're too valuable, blah, blah, blah. Well, guess what? They just waited and at one time, Black & Decker took a dip and then Stanley moved in and said, yeah, we're, we're, we're actually acquiring your company and we're merging you. And now they're in, in, the, in the process of integrating. Both are global companies. Average number of months that it takes to recover from a US recession. What would you say? Two years, 18 months, okay. Here's the answer. 18 months, the last few have been artificially compressed to 10 months. And everybody is like saying, oh, no problem. Recessions are getting better. Yeah, mm -hmm. if you understand all of the indicators, there's this artificial and, and at some point this bubble is about to pop because we've been sort of deferring and kicking the can down the road and there's no more field left to, to go uh, to, to the right. And so you want to make sure that you're prepared. Seven ways, and actually I want to get into, I, I want to kind of skip this because this information is already in your books, but I do want to get the, the uh, information about upcoming activities, all of this. It's in your books. Here's an ebook that we're offering, and there's a talk that's coming up uh, that I'm doing in November as a webcast with the great IT professional. How many of you are actually um, part of I, a great IT professional? You've seen some of their content. So this particular is a webcast that I'm doing in November, and I have the dates. So I can send information if you're interested. This is the ebook. You guys can start reading up. We're going to be uh, doing a, a one-hour conversation regarding. Uh, these things that are about scaling companies quickly. And for more, you can, that's a check-in. If you missed it earlier, that's where you can check in. Any questions? I think we might have a couple of minutes or are we? Two minutes, okay. Any questions? Yes. Yes, uh, I have a question in terms of a very uh, small business oriented question, I would say. What to do to small businesses, let's say, so that we can all understand. Maybe a coffee shop, Yes. It's about like future people to training and other things like what happens to So all those things they, all those different type of businesses have one thing in common and that's uh, they're all service providers, right? Restaurants, what is the you you think you're buying the meal, but really the, what you're buying is a service of getting that meal served the way you want it to be served. Um, the same thing for consulting firms, you know, these are services you're providing because you're providing knowledge at the right time when people know that they need additional information before they can make critical decisions. So all of these are, can be managed as services and there are things that I can point you to to actually start planning uh, if you're planning a, a business that's going to be providing services at some point. And the only difference is you're either providing services to co consumers or in some cases to other businesses, meaning you're a uh, B2B type of vendor. You can have both as well. So let, let, me, let me just say this, if you're planning on launching a company, all these companies that I mentioned earlier, when they launch, they launch during a recession, right? So it doesn't really matter if you're going to be a Main Street business, it, it really is about utilizing this in a more specific, focused way for your, what you want to do, what you want the business to be, and make it happen because all of these principles can be done, it's just a smaller scale and you need to be more specific, more, more targeted, and do, and do your, your research before you actually launch the company. Yes? Very quickly, from a historical point of view, 
why were these companies launched during the Depression? Just because the founders didn't have any other work? That's, yeah. I mean, you think about Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, they, they, didn't, they, didn't, they didn't have a college education, right? They just said, yeah, we have an idea, and they went for it. So no one said there's an advantage to launching a company in the middle of the No one has said that, but, but what I'm saying is, what, what you see right now, okay, those companies that are being launched by people who are inventors, which is what Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and their teams were, they invented something new, not in the market. Those usually build value much quicker than other, you know, me too businesses that spring up. Yeah. So you got to look at, do you have the right idea? And is this the right moment for us to get, you know, cause there won't be anything better for at least a few, a few months, a few years. Thanks for the question. I want to tell you that I'm going to be available. If you have any other questions, I'll be here the entire day. So just look for me. And then if you have any other questions, I can answer them offline. Thank you very much.